the talk is Intro to Linux Hardening. Um, I, my name is Chris J. I am Radis on the channel. I am Radis on Twitter. I am Radis everywhere, unless I'm going by Chris J. Um, I pick locks. I run the Ann Arbor chapter of Tool. And I've been doing network engineering and Linux system administration since the mid to late 90s. Um, engineering has been a little bit longer than the admin side. What this talk is, is a basic beginner level talk of how to harden your systems. <laughs> no, I'm going to stand over here now. Um, basic beginner level talk. He is. He's got me on his little MacBook. Um, well, it's not really little. But anyways, and the lighting actually isn't very good on that either, unless it's just a bad angle on the screen. Um, anyways, what this is is a basic beginner talk. It's not going to be high depth. It's not going to cover tools like Bastille or any of the other lot other tools. It is going to cover a couple of basic tools, but not a lot. Um, this idea came from a conversation between, well, actually it came from a couple things. It just kept building. It started at RUCTF, where we had some time to kill, and people started scanning each other to see what you're running, what you're not running. And we started hacking each other. Yeah, basically when we started hacking each other. Yeah. Um, from there, it led to a conversation on Twitter between Ryan Harp, which is Bootsec, and Nicole, I can never remember Nicole's last name, but Rogue Clown. Um, we were talking about using BT, and which is Backtrack, on a regular basis, and how the simple mistakes you make when you first start using it, where you don't change the root pass, where you bring up the networking, next thing you know, your box is being shut down by a counter hacker, you know, somebody on the network caught you, shutting you down. Ryan was talking about how he likes to find people on his network using it, post a message on their screen saying, yeah, you're not allowed to do this, and then turn the computer off. <laughs> so this is going to help you avoid that, hopefully. Um, I built a lab out of this. These are the lab machines that were actually involved in the lab. A couple of the IP addresses changed. Um, I have an installed version of Backtrack, a virtual version of Backtrack. Whistler is my Linux host. Um, and then I installed CentOS from a live CD and Ubuntu 10.10 10, 10, 10 from a live CD. Um, I was going to use desktop, but or I was going to use Ubuntu server, but desktop actually installs a little bit more than server does. And server install installed nothing as a default. Um, so the first thing, and I don't know how well you can see these, um, open ports on CentOS. It actually didn't have anything open to begin with. I actually had to install um, SSH to, in order to talk to it, but showing what you're, you can expect from a basic install. And the same, well, when you actually look at the ports that are open on it, you've got RPC, SSH, cups, a whole bunch of other things that are open by default internally. And this is your basic install. I didn't make any changes when the screens came up to configure what services you want running. I said accept all and move up, moved on. Um, it does start with IP tables, which is kind of nice. It actually had, but they're pretty permissive. And it uses um, SE Linux out of the box, set to enforcing. A lot of people usually turn that off or set to permissive. Um, Ubuntu, again from the outside, port 22 is open after I installed SSH, but nothing beforehand. But internally, you had, well, actually not a lot. You, again, you had cups. Um, UDP 68, which is DHCP, DHCP client, and a couple other small things like that. And then the ones that have the multiple colons and the number at the end or a star at the end, that's IP6, which we're going to want to start looking at anyways, but the talk doesn't really go into it. Focus more on just the services themselves. So the first thing I wanted to do was turn off cups, just to show how to turn off a service. Don't need it on a server, huh? Cups is your Unix printing service, your common Unix printing service. Don't need a printer, which I was about to say, on a server. Um, so what I did is I used check config levels, the levels I wanted to turn off, and then turned off cups. And then did a t I tested afterwards. Never assume your commands do what, what you told them to do. Always double check it. Went back through, checked cups, make sure it's off. And you can see there it's actually off at all run levels. Um, Ubuntu? Hey, Chris? Yes. Yeah, that's the other thing. So when you reboot, it's not going to come back up. Instead of just saying server stop, 
Um, Debian slash Ubuntu, they do it a little bit different. They use R, um, update RCD. And unfortunately, what should have worked here didn't. Um, I don't know if you can actually read the text, but the text says, normally the above commands work, but cups in this version of Ubuntu has, has to be done by editing the config file. And in order to do that, you have to, you have to go into slash etchy slash cupsd.com and comment out the startup commands and then reboot in order to kill it all completely. Because even telling it to kill cups was saying, cups isn't running. We don't have any scripts for this. We can't do this. Um, but typically, it would just be a case of either sudo update dash rc dot d cups disable or remove. But like I said, in this case, it's throwing back errors saying that there's no init scripts. Searching around online, I had to actually go and make edits to the configuration file. So beyond that, you can actually use firewalls. And this is a slightly modified script that I got off of um, Nixcraft for your firewall. This one's going to basically drop all input while allowing all outbound traffic. That's the first two lines. Um, the second two lines allow all the loopback tra traffic to happen. The next set is going to be allowing stuff back in that you've initiated out. Finally, turning on port 22 so I can actually log back into the server. Because when I did this the first time, I didn't include those lines. And as soon as I put the input drop, I lost my secure shell connection. Yeah, if this would have been anywhere other than my laptop on a virtual box, I would have been hosed. Um, it was a virtual server, so I was able to change screens. So I was able to pull up the, the actual virtual terminal, go back in, and blow out the entire config anyways. But yeah, this, the Sleep 60 works really nice if you mess up like that. Um, and then the very last thing I'm doing is logging it and rejecting anything that hasn't been authorized to go through. So if something does make it past the first drop, it's going to get rejected at the bottom. And it will log, which we will see shortly. Turning your firewall off, that's a nice little script to put behind the Sleep 60 to flush your rules and kill your firewall. But basically drops everything you have and puts back, except everything that's coming in. Um, so one of the things you want, you want to do is you want to hide what your, what your box is. Or you might want to change your name because you've moved your architecture or whatever. Two different ways to do it. CentOS style, Red Hat style. You go into a file called slash etsy forward slash um, sysconfig forward slash network. Change it, restart your network. And that's what it is. It's the host name, and you can change your host name there. A couple other files you can touch, but that's the one that really matters. No, it's actually all in sysconfig. Yeah. Right. I'm looking for long term at this, at this point. Um, Debian slash Ubuntu, a little bit different. It's actually the slash etsy hostname file. And there's supposed to be a shell script that you can run in your nits, but this again, this version didn't have it in it, so I had to reboot to get them to change this mate. A couple other places you can change it too. Um, they suggest under slash etsy host. And there's one other place I can't remember off the top of my head. Changing the password, pretty simple. Logging as you usually want to change it as. Type the word P-A-S-S-W-D. -S -S It'll ask you for your new password. In this case, I'm changing the password for root on the back backrack box. Um, basically, just showing how to do it. Not that hard. Pretty simple. Adding a user. CentOS didn't add a user to begin with on install. So everything had to be done by root. It did ask for a root password when you started. Installing um, Ubuntu asked you for a regular user to use on a, on a regular basis, but didn't give you an option to set your root password because it's automatically generated into something that you don't know. No, that you can actually go back in um, sudo su and then change the root password to be wherever you want. So it's not actually disabled; it's actually set to something. They expect you to sudo. Yeah. They expect you to sudo, but it's not actually disabled. If it was disabled, you wouldn't be able to change it. Yeah. Um, 
but if you want to add more users or you're using a distro that didn't give you a choice to add users when you're doing the install, um, you would use the add user command. You can do either. Um, one is add user actually calls user add, but it's the way it does it. You'll see shortly. Um, SSHD. Every single server I installed in the last three weeks, they all allowed root to log in as SSH. So if you tried to SSH into a box, it would allow root to log into it if you had the password. You could forward tunnels. So if you're, you can do SSH tunneling. So if you're set up right, you can actually create the SSH connection and then push your traffic through it to something else. Um, Lynn was talking about doing that with Apache to run Nessus on a remote server. So you don't actually have to log into port 80. Um, and then X forwarding, it'll actually forward stuff back from the, or send the stuff back from the server to you over your SSH connection. To, so if you logged into it and type Firefox, it'll load Firefox and send the, the output to your local window if you've got an X server running locally. So it's running on your remote box, but it looks local. Um, a lot of places turn those off just to lock things down a little bit. So Apache, default config, and I, I screenshots are probably a little small to read. It's basically a grep on the Apache directory saying, show me port, eight, port 80. And when you look at the net stats earlier, it's showing that it's listening on all interfaces. I didn't like that. So I went in and changed it to this little, just to listen on um, the loopback interface, which was a quick change under the Apache configs. Restart Apache and it now listens just locally instead of everywhere. Mail, there's a lot of ways to do it. I didn't want to sit down and throw up screenshots of send mail, postfix, XM. Um, usually when I set up a server, I set it up for local mail only. And then if I need to, go back in and set it up to use a remote smart host. Um, a few extras, and you can't really see this. One is log check. It actually emails you the interesting logs of what's happened and changed on your box in the last however long you have cron set up to run it for. Um, deny hosts. Actually, the next one is talking about Tripwire. It sits there, monitors your files to see what's changed. It takes a lot of configuration to do, a lot of time to set it up. And even then, you have to go back in and actually tweak it when you get your email messages and errors. It's a real pain. But it, yeah, it is. It's really good once it's set up. It just takes a long time to set it up. Maybe. It, well, so what's going to do is it's going to watch your files and then tell you if anything's changed. Mm -hmm. And it usually watches certain system files that attackers will go after. And it'll tell you. It doesn't tell you real time if it's changed, but it'll tell you at some point that you know next time it runs um, the cron script that checks the scripts, it'll tell you it's changed. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a nice tool. It's a pain to set up. Um, I've actually got it on the Rats and Rogue server. I still need to tweak it. So I'm getting a lot of just garbage in the email, but I still scroll through it because I'm too lazy to tweak it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> or, yeah, or... With that, isn't it true that it uh, feels free to use as a non-commercial user, but if you're using it commercial, you have to pay? There's an open source version and a enterprise version, but I don't know what the requirements are for the two separate pieces. The thing about Rats and Rogue is I'm not making money off that. I'm not talking yeah, about you but I'm I, that I that I can't answer. You'll actually have to check. I know there's an open source community edition, which is what's usually in the repositories, and then there's a paid commercial version. Um, the, the difference between the two. In fact, until last night, I didn't even know that. So, yes, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Lynn's saying that if it's for uh, commercial use, you have to pay. The last, confirm. yeah, but definitely confirm. Um, if you go to tripwire.com or tripwire.org, it takes you to the overall product and just talks about the two different types. Um, the last one I looked at here is a way to block people that are trying to get in, which personally I like to deny hosts. It basic, the other option is fail to ban, um, which I was going to mention. I've never gotten fail to ban to work. I've never gotten fail to ban to work. Um, <laughs> Kyle's saying it's easy. 
Afghan install and saw failed a man too, but <laughs> so the nice thing about fail to ban is you can actually set it up for more than just SSH. You can set it up to block pretty much everything, yeah. I know it'll do um, web login failures, it'll do SSH login failures. That's the only two things I've ever looked at it for. Um, I happen to use deny hosts for SSH purposes. And that's all it really looks at. It's a Python script. In fact, after I installed deny hosts on the backtrack box, I couldn't log into it anymore. <laughs> because one of the things I have is no root logins. But it went back through the config files when it loaded the daemon and saw that I was logging in root previously. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. Um, but the deny host, what it does is it updates your um, host.deny file, and you can actually set it to block just SSH or everything. I usually set it to block everything, because if you're trying to get into SSH, I'm sure you're going to be coming after something else next. And it sends out a nice email report every time it blocks somebody. So it's a nice tool. I like it. It's what I've been using for years. Yeah. Yeah, you can, so you can, you can actually set it up to, so like what Kyle's saying is you can forge your denies to the centralized server and everybody can pull that down and automatically adds to your deny host file. Um, it also purges after a set amount of time. I'm not that nice. Once you're on my, once you're on my bad list, you never get purged. I have to take you out by hand. Um, when I first started using deny host, it was actually for a SFTP server for uh, the customer at the time was Playboy. And basically they were sending, we were sending um, scans of the magazines back and forth. So the company I worked for was scanning it. We had an SFTP server set up to let the, let the Playboy people log in, pull it, do quality assurance, or do quality um, QA on it, make sure it met the quality, said yes, no, okay, push forward, no, rescan these, whatever. They were worried about people stealing the content, and an iHost is part of, the system, part of the solution to keep people out, is what I used. It worked really good. They had people testing it, and they were never able to get past any of the security features I put in place. So I did something right. <laughs> Probably the only time I ever did something right, but I did something right. Um, so what does this have to do with Backtrack? And why have I been talking about basic hardening of a Linux box when everybody wants to play with Backtrack? Well, this quote is actually from Pure Hate, which is one of the um, people involved with making Backtrack. It was an answer to, it's part of the answer to a question on what distro to use at a hacking conference. And part of the answer, and this came out of the ISD podcast channel on Freenode, but part of the answer was, BT is not meant to be secure. It is a security distro. It is not a secure distro. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, Part of this talk came about talking about how people were counter hacking, people pin testing the network, turning off their computers, popping up messages, and showing them, you know, yeah, this is great, you know what you're doing, but, or you got a nice little toy here, but you really don't know what you're doing. Go away. Um, if I'm going to use Backtrack, I'm going to put it on a dedicated machine. It's not going to have anything else on there but the hard drive for that dedicated machine, unless it's got a second security distro, either an older version of Backtrack or Matrix or something else like that installed alongside of it. But at the same time, it's not going to be a regular use machine. I'm not going to store stuff in the home directory. I'm not going to even set up a typical home directory. Virtual machines are nice for labs, but not for real world use. Um, dual booting is fine for some things, but if it's going to be your dedicated attack box that you're going on the site with or trying to attack a network with, no, it's not great. Unless, again, like I said, it's got a secondary attack system on it, that, so you're sharing resources between the two. Um, like, wireless, act, wireless attacks in Backtrack 3 are better than what they were in Backtrack 4, and what's in Backtrack 4 is better than Backtrack, backtrack 5. So when I got my OSWP, we used Backtrack 3. 
I guess now they're using Backtrack 5 and people are complaining about it. Um, and the OSWP is Offensive Securities Wireless Professional. And then um, listening to the IDS, ISD podcast a couple weeks ago, one of their, one of their people, Boris, um, he's known as Jay Security on Twitter, was talking about when he does a pin test, he'll use a live CD at, with a dedicated USB drive mounted that he puts all the data to and then gives that USB to the client at the end of the project. Um, at the end of the testing. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is it's a live media that you can't write to. So having stuff injected into it's a little bit harder. Um, that, that brings me to my question. Can you talk a little bit more about virtual machines? Because that's my, the way I usually set up back track and input. All right, so virtual machine, and you'll see why, why I recommend against that in a second. Oh, you're going to go into that. I'm going to go into that. Each one of these points has, some, has something behind it that backs it up. Um, virtual machines are great for labs. If you want a portable lab, if anybody looks in my Firefox bag, they'll find my laptop. It's got seven different virtual machines in it. It lets me attack, defend, play around, make screenshots, whatever I want to do. But I wouldn't actually use that in an attack environment. Um, reason one, this is the Wireshark capture that I ran this morning. Actually, well, yeah, it was about 2.30 this morning um, from the virtual machine. All I did there was start up Chrome to go search something. And that's only a small fraction of the output that the host machine was leaking out. Now, if you're on a network, um, I just realized the slides I left out. If you're on the network, that's going to start broadcasting out. That's going to start looking for things. If your host machine is using NTP, it's going to be trying to hit time servers to update itself, which is why I saw RUTCF. Um, your host machine is going to be making more noise on the network. It might help hide you, but you're giving away more information that you're there to begin with. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's a lot of noise when it's expected to be quiet. Um, one of the things I did, and like I said, I left the slides out. I actually turned off the network for the host machine just to see what happened. I could hit the host, I could hit the guests, all the VMs on it, but I couldn't hit the other server that I had running where I actually had Backtrack installed at because that was a separate box. Um, so and I couldn't hit Google, I couldn't hit anything else. So if I wanted to hit anything in the lab, yeah, fine. If I wanted to, you know, I'm trying to shrink my footprint a little bit so I'm not leaking out stuff from my host. Yeah. Um, installing to your hard drive versus installing to a virtual server. This slide is actually kind of faked. Um, this is. I want my money back. <laughs> um, this is the results that you would typically typically get. What? Just trying to ignore you. Oh. <laughs> um, so what I mean by this is kind of faked. This wasn't the drive that Patrick was installed on but this is one of the drives in the box. Um, as you can see, it, it looks like a regular box. It says, I, I have a Maxter hard drive with this information. Um, I've actually used this one of the few times I've ever done an attack. We provided a server to a company for, it was a business partner at a previous company. Um, they took the server, installed virtual or VMware on it, or actually I think it was VirtualBox, and then gave us a slice of the box that we provided them instead of the entire box that they were supposed to. And I can understand why the, the software that needed the entire box kept failing because it didn't have all of its resources. And what gave it away, and I had the same slide twice. I, oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so if you look here, instead of being Maxter, Seagate, or whatever, it says VBox. And that was the first thing that gave it away when I was looking at the server that I was asked to look at that was at our customers, or our partner's location, why is this failing? Can you go see if everything's optimized, they installed it right, and the very first thing I see is it's got VBox heart for a hard drive. Um, yeah, they didn't give us our box, they gave us a slice, and who knows what they're using our box for. Um, yeah, well, it turns out they were using the box, they just VMware and then Windows on top of it, and they don't understand why it didn't work, because that was their standard. Um, 
Yeah. So Lynn said he loves stupid standards, but hey, you know, that's the way it was. So if you're using a virtual box, you're going to leak information that it's a virtual machine. That tells me there's a host underneath that I can attack. And there have been exploits put out there that can attack the host from the virtual box. If I can get root on one, I can start attack on the second. Um, why not the why not do do bolt or multi boot or dual boot? This is the box that was actually with Backtrack installed on it. Um, you see three of the drives there. That's plenty of material for me to go after. I can try. I've already seen it, and I can go try and mount it. You know what's what's underneath it? You know, is it just a copy of my comic collection, or do I do I have my banking data there? Do I have Bookmark files that, from Firefox that have passwords associated with them, password files in Mozilla. Client data. Client data. So there's a lot of things that you can, if you're running it dual boot, everything on that box, and the same holds true for a live CD, everything on the box underneath it is accessible at some point. You can find the disks, you can mount them. Encrypting them, encryption is a little bit harder, but I know if I've got a script I've been working on and I've left it on my hard drive, Oh, I don't need to worry about this. I'm running it from the live CD. I can grab this off my hard drive. I'm going to mount the, the encrypted drive at some point to grab the script. Well, the entire time it's mounted, it's there for somebody else to parse through. That's a good segue to a couple questions down on the channel. Okay. The first one is MWJ Computing asking if you wear a bulletproof vest when you secure Linux boxes. <laughs> <laughs> that, on a more serious note, though, Secure Lexicon asked what your thoughts were about using um, the and it sounds like that you'd have some more concerns, right? So, in this particular instance, like I said, you don't actually see the drive because it was SDD. It was a old hard drive I had sitting in a USB caddy. Same issues. Mm -hmm. um, so technically, what I have here, even though it's a physical hard drive, it's connected via USB, and you can see what's being leaked from USB. So anything in your underlying OS or host machine is not those volumes, eventually the data would be being protected to be rooted on the USB. Yep. But it doesn't say that you can't delete the hard drive. This is true. You could do that too. Well, I said multi boot, but multi booting off the same hard drive. Well the question wasn't about multi booting. The question well, is it's question. Into a USB, right? right. Which is the same as you Right. You can pull your hard drive and just have the USB drive as your backup or, or whatever. But as I said, if you don't do that, this is the same information that's given away by a live CD. So it's the same issue. If you want to use a USB, you know, get a, a little cheap laptop without a hard drive in it and use it that way. But if it's got a hard drive inside it and you, you forgot to take it out or, yeah, but if you forgot to take it out, you know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I've got to go do this now because I've got to go recover data. I've got to go redo. Stuff gets lost during the original pen test. You have to go back before your contract runs out to hit it again. Um, mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. You want to make it as mistake proof as possible. Yeah. The goal is to make it as idiot and mistake proof as possible. Um, changing the name, we've talked about this. This is where I'm changing it from BT to Asherah. Had to reboot at the end. Um, this showing that I've actually changed the name of it. No, I, I know somebody wants to know why am I calling this box Asherah. <laughs> My naming channel asks why you call it Asherah. <laughs> My naming convention is actually rather interesting. My personal naming convention is based on something that has to do with underwater archaeology, because that's what I went to college for before I went to um, computer security. Is it underwater masturbating? Yes. <laughs> um, so underwater archaeology. Asherah was actually the name of the first remote sub that was ever used. Um, no, I don't have a Jason. And then Whistler is actually a reference to a Star Wars novel, but my laptop is outside the naming normal or the normal naming convention. Um, again, I'm showing how to change the password, and it's actually the same slide as before. Adding a user, so you ask user add or add user. User add, you usually have to, and they've made some changes along the way, but I'm still used to user add. You have to have everything lined up as you, when you, as one long command, command. So you have to have your username, whatever information you want in there with it, the group, 
the user ID, everything. It is, but add user is the script. And it's actually included on most distros now. So it goes through and it asks you everything that you want to do instead of having to do it at the command line. Remember, wait, is that supposed to be a capital G or a small g? So that's why I like it. Also, if you notice at the bottom, it's got VBox add. So this is done on the virtual box. The only thing I installed on it that wasn't basic was the virtual box additions. So again, it's leaking information saying that I am a virtual box, which again tells you there's something underneath it. Um, by sudo, every, well, I'm not going to say everybody, but a lot of people have a tendency of going out and whatever user they add to the my sudo file, give it all permissions like root above it, but you can actually tell what commands individually. In this particular case, I created my Twitter handle, regular handle, whatever you want to call it, and I actually set it up to be just bin su. So all that account can do is change to root. It can't do anything else. Well, yeah, it's to any user, but yeah. Well, su without anything behind it is usually going to be to root, but yeah, it'll change to any other user on the box. Um, so su to rat, run from root to my RAS account. The dash behind it says load the RAS profile behind it. Um, print, change back to my home directory. Said show me sudo, show me my working directory. Sorry, can't do that. That command isn't allowed. Or user radis can't run this command as root on this box. Okay, well let's shut the box down. Again, sorry, can't do that on this box. Being the one command, it's going to make it a little bit harder for somebody counter hacking you to figure out what exactly it is you can run as that user. You could do it that way too, and have each one be able to do a little bit different. Um, yeah, that's that's more work than I wanted to work. With. Huh? <laughs> um, so then I changed back to root. Open ports. This is what the. Uh, I'm on the virtual here actually scanning back to the installed version of Backtrack. Nothing was actually open by default. Hmm? Yeah, until you turn it on. If you look at the box itself, um, or actually no, this is from the installed box, looking at everything that was open on the virtual box. It had 22, which I had opened. Port 80, which is open, which is really interesting. Um, that opened up when I installed Nessus because Nessus is done via the web interface now. RCP find and the last one. Uh, local host for that one is the, that's the virtual install. But, um, and this is actually being scanned from the installed box. So it's the installed version going to the VM. The other two were installed previously with Backtrack 4 because this box was originally a Backtrack 4 box that got upgraded to Backtrack 5. So the ports that were already open stayed open. Um, well, I didn't like having all those ports open in the last slide, so I installed IP tables. So went back and copied and pasted that script from the very beginning. And that's basically just showing that, showing that all the ports are still open. And then Run nmap against the against run nmap against again, and you now only have port 22, which is the only one that exposed through IP tables. It should, but <laughs> you know, it's a basic talk. It's the beginning. You know, I'm not telling you to store stuff in slash temp at least. Um, going back through. Ooh, ooh, I just caught what he said. <laughs> um, going back through, okay, it's been blocked. So what happens when I try to open port 80? Use netcat. Connection refused. Scan it again, just that single port. Now it's showing filtered. So the previous version didn't even show it, even though it, was, it should have showed up filtered. Um, the other thing that was going on in the background is I included a the, the drop and log, and I started a tail of slash FTD messages, which is the default location. You can change it, but then it moves all the kernel warning messages to whatever t log file you tell it to go to, which I don't really like. 
They say that U-Log works a little bit better, but I didn't want to spend the time learning about that last night. Um, yes, at 4 o'clock in the morning, yes. Um, I'm actually walk, repping on dropped, so I'm just seeing the log files for this. And you can see where it's the other box trying to connect in on port 80 and dropping the connection. So you can, if you start this in the background, you can see somebody trying to hit, get into your box. You, know, you start this up and run it on the side. You can also DOS yourself, yeah. Um, so I was talking about securing SHHD. I went in and changed root login to no, X forwarding to no, and allow TCP forwarding to no, then restart SSH. And that's going to stop the three things I was talking about earlier, where you have people logging in this root. Um, this particular version, version 2, is actually um, the default, and it was part of the default config. Was that the same in all the ones that you installed? It was, because everything was very recent. But if you have an older box, you'll, you should force version 2, and there's basically one line further up in the config, near, near the beginning of the config, that you actually have to change to version 2. Um, I remember a lot, for a long time it was version 1, 2, but most of them now are just version 2. Um, it might be. It's been so long since I looked at it, because I'm. It's one of those things I never have to change. Quick scan. Yep, it doesn't say one comma two. Doesn't say one. Move along. I may be ignorant on this, but why are you not submitting RSA applications? Um. Actually, in this case, I just grabbed on no because I was too lazy to copy and paste things. <laughs> but the that's actually, yeah, the RSA authentication is actually the default for this particular version of um, SSHD. Um, trying to log in as root, it just sits there and keeps asking you for the password. After six tries, it drops you. With the deny host behind it, it'll still ask you six times. But when you try reconnecting again, it won't let you in at all. Um, depending on how you have the night host configured, you can actually have it set up so if you fat finger twice, it drops you. It locks you out. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done that quite a bit. And, it, and then I have to wait until I go home. And um, Again, I'm setting up Apache to only listen on localhost. Even though I've got it filtered, I want to take a little bit extra step there in case something happens to the IP table, gets dropped for some reason, or something makes it through. It's still only listening to the port 80 on local host. Um, so patching, after the initial install, and on a regular basis, try to keep your system up to date if you're installing it. Um, patching, on a pa <laughs> patching on Debian based systems, which Backtrack is, even though they say it's based on Ubuntu, Ubuntu is based on Debian. I do everything from command line, or as much as I can from command line. This is the default patchy, or default app. Yeah, Ryan, or Kyle's got a point. Can you go back in, force it to use SSL. Um, but it's basically one command, app get update, hits the repositories, pulls all the latest versions. Um, I usually change the repo URLs, but I'm sure you can do it in the comp. The only time I've played with comp, I've ended up messing things up because I had to set the proxies and then it, I can never get the proxy to go away. Um, and then the upgrade it is just a quick case of app get update or up, app get upgrade afterwards. So it's a two part command. And as you can see I had stuff to update last night. Um, last steps, set up tripwire, deny host or fail to ban. Um, image the box. So if you've got the box the way you want it, make a backup image of it. So every time, after, every time you've used it, you've got an easy way to reinstall what you know is a good system. Um, just in case something happens and you missed it. When you're on site, save to a USB drive. That was Boris's tip. Um, basically, it lets you have everything that you're working on, everything you need, saved to a drive, raw format, or however you want to do it. And then you can actually give that to your client when you're done. Um, 
Yeah. So when I started talking about this, Wolf said, oh, use Multex or Mutex or however you want to pronounce it. This is Multex, however you want to pronounce it. This is the scan against a fresh install of um, Multex. It was actually on the same USB drive I was using for, or all the same hard drive I was using for the backtrack install version. That's the open port that comes, start, comes with standard, and it's actually pure Debian based. Nice things about that when you're installing it, it does actually ask you to create a local user and a local root password. Um, so hopefully this will lead to a, a series of win and less likely to yeah, less likely to uh, get hit up. It's a picture from the Pittsburgh wing, Wings game. So hopefully you'll end up with a champagne shower, not a golden shower. <laughs> Um, resources for this, it, these are the books I've been I've used and the site I used. Um, it was nice actually going back through and rereading things over the last few weeks, preparing for this talk. Picked up some stuff I forgot. Questions? I got a few in the channel, but I'll wait for you. So, one of the questions is you mentioned I think it was Boosec, Boosie's backtrack, and he pops up a message and shuts his machine down. How does he actually do that? He didn't say, but more than likely he's logging in because they're not changing the root password. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then you can do a, when you do a shutdown, you can do a shutdown and then automatically. Yeah, I'll broadcast. You can. And if he's really lazy, he finally has a switch. Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually hoping he'd be here so he could explain that part of it, but. Wall only works though on um, if you have a console up. So if it's just sitting there idle with no terminal windows open, you'll have to you'll have to find a way to pop in a, a message window to pop up. Shut down. Shut down. After you do a VPN. You're running a The next question is: Dcom said, hypothetically speaking, if, <laughs> if he happens to be in a hotel room. And he happens to see backtrack. One, how would he find backtrack in the network? And two, how would he break into it? Um, you know, I spent a lot of time. Well, yeah, try SSH into it with root and tor. Um, <laughs> hypothetically, I, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out. <clears throat> well, first, the, the first half of that question is how do you find it on the network? Yeah. I spent a lot of time, other than running an nmap, which is something Bob would do with fingerprints turned on, and hopefully a more recent version of MMAP than what's on my host machine. Um, there's that option too, so you who's attacking somebody else. Right, so you see one person. All right. Wait till they don't thank you. Then you know their password already, so as long as they pass the same right? Yep. That's an open question. Another question comes in from Secure Lexicon. Secure Lexicon asks, where does it go? He is curious to know how to use VT VMware to pen test effectively. You could. I mean, it's so my complaint about using B, BT from a VM is it puts your host system at risk. You're going to have extra noise because of your host, but there's not actually anything stopping you from doing it that way. So it, with, it with VMware, right. if you have another network port, you can just go to it. Well, there's one thing just other than Well, no, because I turned off the, the networking ports. I dropped the, and like I said, I forgot to put those slides in. But when I actually shut down net, the network port, or even took the IP interface, or changed the IP address on the box, yes. everything stopped working, unless I was attacking another virtual machine. Everything on my VM was set up as bridged. So you would think that it's going to, even though there's no IP address configured on the regular interface, it would still be able to use the bridged interface. But that wasn't the case on my system last night. Well, right. Same thing happens in Hyper-V. So when I found the Hyper-V instance, I had one Hyper-V network interface that was dedicated for the VM, and then a separate interface that was dedicated for Hyper-V. When I was using VirtualBox, it, 
was bridged to the yeah it, But I think you bring up a deeper concern, which is even if you did that, if they get into your virtual box or you get into your VM, and then they take advantage of those holes in your guest edition to breach your host, even if you air gap the two networks, you still got a vulnerability there, right? Somehow, I've only read about the VM stuff. I haven't actually played with it. I, I've heard that it's out there. I've read that it's out there. I've seen it done. <laughs> so there's, there's still there. All right. Yeah. Um, it's like if you're using VirtualBox, VirtualBox doesn't have a nice grand design that can be on the AS. And so you're more commonly see somebody who wants to drive across that. You know, I see it all the time on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I see. Back to your networking question, the, the, net, the networking portion of that, though. Um, I was trying that with the built in Ethernet card in my host and the wireless card. And either time I took out the IP address, the bridged host dropped too. It didn't know what to do with it. it was, you were using VirtualBox, right? Yeah. And VirtualBox is screwing. I've, I've done the same thing in VirtualBox. It's the same problem. So from, v, from a point of VMware, I'm not sure yeah. with yeah. networking. And I could see that happening. I'm wondering whether or not you could define it as not even a, you take out all of the, the virtual mix that are assigned to the thing and assign it a actual physics thing directly within the, the OS of the virtual machine. What's virtual box? Do you give a USB device to one virtual box? To my knowledge, it can only be used by that one virtual Correct. box. Okay. So you're, you you'd be limited to one single virtual box. Another thing to consider if you're going to be doing a virtual for your 10 desk distribution, do use bridge, not NAT. Go scan 65,000 ports on one single IP address and you will fill up that NAT cable on your virtual and you will get false negative. I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's bad. So I had the screenshot from Wireshark in there, and the first time I ever found out about that, um, I had set up, we had an issue of hardware and space at a data center, so we moved a lot, as much as we could to a vir virtual instances, and I used VirtualBox because it's what I was familiar with. Um, we also had a, a, a Zen stuff, a bunch of Zen instances I installed, but these are going to be mixed um, networks between Windows and, or mixed boxes between Windows and Linux, so I couldn't just do Zen. Um, I was trying to troubleshoot an issue, and I pulled up Wireshark. Oh, I'm just going to like pull up Wireshark and see what's going on for this one virtual box. And it just starts scrolling by as 3DNS servers and a time server are giving out the information they're supposed to be giving out. And it's just like, um, yeah, that's not good. Yeah, that was without permis permission list. That was just at the host level. It was pulling everything for all the all the guests on it. It was just scrolling by. So, uh, we can actually confirm this. The deep freeze, we can deep freeze on it. I'm not familiar with Orvis. Once you get the box set up the first time, image it, and every time you bring it back from the customer site, re-image it.
I have like slide one or two. <laughs> That is the that's the Abasi lecture that comes on most Ubuntu and I don't think it's got to be a Ubuntu. Um, so that is the Linux version of Bonjour, Rendezvous, MDFS, blah 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 blah, which is essentially a broadcast, uh, a services broadcast, um, which is awesome for Bob to open up the laptop for you, large for probably just standing at find everybody to share pictures because they're broadcasting it on the network and saying, hey, you yeah. might want to repeat that. Okay. So, no, that's not you pointed, like that's that's empty that So what Josh is saying is, um, and why am I using laser pointers? I can't see it. <laughs> if you look at the slide where it says 5353, that's the service, that's Avahi, which is the services broadcaster. So if your D Tom seeing that hot seeing the hotel and wanting to see what's out there. What is it, Port Network Neighborhood or Well it, it, so it all depends on the, um, anything that's MDNS enabled. So things like sprinklers and whatnot. So or uh, especially Max, Max or anything that even says I can run typically will have some form of a listener that's out there. So it's basically local. What they're saying is it's basically local ser sharing services, yeah, and yeah, it's like broadcast and multicast kind of broadcast, multi broadcast, multicast, and then basically you can go find everybody's pictures, music, whatever. Yeah, depending upon what's getting shared by it. So uh, uh, I, there's a utility on the Mac called uh, I think it's the Bonjour browser or Rendezvous browser. You launch that thing up, and then it just goes. Here's all the services that you want to know about, um, and even things like. So if you have a way to look through MD, MD, MDNS, multicast DNS, you can see basically everything that's out there. So if you've got an Ubuntu desktop system that you want, you can use it on other people's networks, uninstall a lot of Yep. Well, like I said, when I, when I set the lab up, the point was to do defaults. You know, it's, it's basically a junior sysadmin set this box up. He was told to go out build a box. And this has happened where I've worked in the past. Um, I was on vacation and they needed three boxes brought up. So the junior guy went, grabbed my CentOS CDs, and just installed everything default. And we go back two slides and we see what Ubuntu or CentOS has default. Um, and this is just in case it's a house that uses Ubuntu because that's how the admin is. Most of them do. So deny host does, log check does. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get around it, which is one of the places where Tripwire comes in handy. You can use a dot forward file, and if that changes and you've got Tripwire set up to look at that, 
It'll let you know that's changed. Um, the other way is to do the aliases file, which is what I usually do. I usually have everything going to root and my personal accounts. And then the boxes I'm really worried about go to an off-site email address too. So I see the logs in multiple places. Didn't say it was a Gmail address. So there is uh, one final question, which is, do you have a comment on the backtrack ODE? <laughs> so the backtrack ODE, um, only thing I really have to say about it is it exists. It's involved with the wireless. And like I said, backtrack 5's wireless is worse than 4, which is worse than 3. Um, but I think it was WICD, which is the wireless controller. Or I've never used it, so. Yeah, the wire, it's part of the wireless system. Um, it came out yesterday, and I really don't have anything to say on it because I scanned through it really fast, and it's like, yeah, it's nice. I'm not talking about that. But, you know, at least you elevate your privileges and make the route not bad. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, don't drop the mic. All right, you done?